Welcome back. Uh, we have a very exciting afternoon planned for you, so hold tight and uh, bring your colleagues in as well. We need to see more of these seats filled, I think. Um, first up, though, we have uh, an excellent uh, debate about to start uh, concerning leveraging emerging technologies for urban challenges. It's going to be moderated by Natalia olsen Uteko, who is here. Natalia, please join me on stage and a warm round of applause for Natalia. Natalia will now take her seat and introduce her panellists, uh, which is a, a top-notch panel. Uh, this is Natalia. I'll hand over to you. You take us through the, sure. your panel. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Buenas tardes. Qué bien estar aquí en Barcelona. Tengo el gran gusto, the great pleasure to have an amazing panel from Colombia to Germany to the US and from Washington DC joining live. Um, so I'm excited to be able to introduce our panelists. As I introduce them really quickly, uh, they're gonna go ahead and take a seat and we're gonna have a very lively conversation about how we can actually apply technology, how we can actually look at best practices, how we can actually share some of the good models what works and what doesn't work. So I'm very, very honored to introduce, to start with, um, Minister Cristina Sinemus from Germany. Cristina, please join us. Since January 18 of 2019, Professor Cristina Simas has been Hessian's first minister for digital strategy and development. Prior to that, Professor Sinemos was the managing director and founder of the consulting agency Genius from 2014 to 2019. She was the first female president of a chamber of industry and commerce in Hesse. In 2011, Cristina Sinemos was appointed professor of public affairs at the Guadruga Guadriga University of Berlin. Thank you for being with us today. Now we have Alcalde, el gran mayor, the big mayor of Medellin, Colombia. Thank you so much. <laughs> mayor Daniel Quintero Calle, it's such a pleasure to have you here in Barcelona. It's unbelievable because it's just, I always talk about your model and the amazing things that Medellin has done. So we're excited to have you. Um, he is not only the mayor, but he is also an el electronic engineer from the University of Antique. An Antioquia, pardon, a finance spe specialist, it has an MBA from BU and studies in public administration from Harvard, and he has focused on climate change, which is what we're going to be, some of the things we're going to be talking about. He has more than 10 years of experience as a software developer with the ICT sector. He founded Intrasoft uh, and has been the CEO of Impulsa, uh, an organization we in the U.S. government work a lot with. He's a vice minister of ICT and VM digital technology of ICT Ministry of Colombia. Thank you for being here. And where is Casey? Oh, Casey, so great to see you again. Casey Roach is a vice president of the global public sector for Cisco. She is responsible for the development and execution of Cisco's worldwide government education healthcare, and go-to-market strategy. Casey is a seasoned bus business leader who is highly regarded for her expertise in leading organizational transformation and driving sustainable long-term growth. And that's what we need in cities, right? We need that balance between business, between technology, and public policy. So we're excited to have her here today. And hopefully, there is Same Wahba, one of my friends at the World Bank. He is the global director for the World Bank's Urban Disaster Risk Management, Resilience, Land Global Practice. Same holds a PhD in urban planning, big fan of that, from Harvard University with 25 years of experience in the field of urban development. He is a member of WF's Global Future Council on Cities and Urbanization, and he sits on the boards of City Alliance, Resilient Cities Network, and the WRI, Raw Center for Cities. Please welcome our wonderful panelists, ready to talk about how we actually can solve all the problems in the world, especially at the local level. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to go ahead and sit down, and I'm going to ask my wonderful panelists to talk a little bit about themselves, uh, 
say a little bit about what they're working on, and then we're going to delve into some questions so we can actually start having an interesting conversation and sharing best practices. Please, Minister. Mm. You already um, pointed out where I'm coming from. I'm yes. coming from uh, building up a startup in a time when nobody was fine with building startup out of university. It was 1998. And when I built up the startup, I have a lot of emphasis in benefiting things to the people. So what I want to do is bringing technology um, to the people. So that was a startup genius which deals with science and communication. And as you already said, uh, I have the honor to be the first woman in a chamber of commerce. And there, the clue for me was our region bring forward as a Silicon Valley of Europe. Because we have a lot of technical um, universities, we have a lot of research, we have a lot of economists like Merck, like other big companies who really can change uh, with their technique the future. And then I get a phone call from the Minister of President of Hessen and he asked me whether I would like to build up a new ministry, a ministry which was till now not built and the ministry should have the clue of bringing digitalization in Hessen forward. And I said, and are there any, is, is there anything I have a hindernis or something like this? And he said, no, it's your chance. If you say yes, you can build it up as you like. And if you say no, I will ask somebody else. And I said, no, no risk, no fun. I want to go forward with it. I think digitalization is really a future challenge and a future chance for the people. And we have to take the people with us because it's a kind of a culture change. And if you want to really go forward with this culture change, I think I have a lot of experience in building up a startup company, I'm building up uh, um, a chamber of commerce or rebuild them. So I said, yes, I start up a ministry. And I build it up as a startup company. It's Agile. We are bundling and cooperate all the issues with the colleagues. And, and I think this is a main point which we have in Hessen and in other countries not. We are bundling the money as well. 1.2 billion euro. And everybody has to come to me. And if I said, yes, you get the money, they get the money. If I said, no, no. But we do not want to be restrict. We want to bring the digitalization forward. So we are looking for new and innovative pro um, programs and projects. We are looking how we have to have synergies with the other ministries for economy, for education, and uh, for health. We are looking how we really go faster forward in digitalization. And for me, the middle and the one who, for who we're doing this are the people. And I always try to change my perspective when I'm discussing with my colleagues. I want to perspect of the view of the people who have to use digitalization. And this is how we build up the ministry, and this is how we build up the strategy, Digital Hessen, where future has its home. And the home of the people in Hessen should be the future of digitalization, and therefore we build up a smart region area, and I think on the long term, the balance and the cooperation between public sector, politics, and the people that is the future of digitalization, and we have to have in mind that it's only by dialogue, by cooperation, and by looking for the benefit of the people. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. <laughs> Señor Alcalde? Well, I, I'm Daniel Quintero. I'm the mayor of Medellin. I grew up in a city that was considered actually was the most dangerous city in the world, never by anyone overcome. Just to get an idea, I, I got some numbers of the 
murder rate by 100,000 inhabitants. So Barcelona has three out of 100,000 inhabitants murders per year. Uh, Frankfurt, 0 0.7. Denver, 0 0.1. And actually it's considered one of the most dangerous cities <laughs> in, in America. Well, the most dangerous city in the world right now is Tijuana, and it has 138 murders per 100 inhabit 100,000 inhabitants. Well, Medellin by 1991 had 400 murders per 100 out of 100,000 inhabitants. Medellin was considered by that time the city of no future. By that time, by 1991, 1991, I was 10 years old. For me, my city was my city. And I used to play the regular place with children in my city. Uh, we call it escondidijos, seguimientos. <laughs> but the, the truth was that year, in 1991, 7,000, many of them children, were killed wow. by bullets that sometimes were more expensive than the lives of those children because they don't have any future. So by that time, our parents were trying to do everything so we don't go to the streets. And in my case, the only thing that kept me at home was actually a computer. My mother gave me a computer when I was 12 years old. And she died two years later without knowing that that computer changed my life. I become an engineer. I, I become actually a mayor. And as a mayor, I create a, a program, a developing plan called the Future for Medellin, or Medellin Future. Because what I really believe is that if we give to children opportunities, computers, for example, we can change their lives. So we're, we're having right now a program called One Child, One Computer, in which we are giving every child a computer and also creating a neutral network so we give or we cover all our area, our, our city with internet of high quality. We are changing all the education in our city so the children have all of them like technical knowledge after they finish uh, schools. We are giving free high school education to every child in our city. And we are creating a city that is becoming, actually was just uh, transformed or recognized by the central government as a district for science, technology, and innovation. We are creating a software valley. We are investing on people. And we're, we really believe that the most important thing governments has to do is to reduce inequality by giving the best education and the best tools for the people that doesn't have access to them. So we're creating the, the Medellin of the future, and we are here to, to show a new face of this Medellin. We are any longer the city of Pablo Escobar. We're a new city. Using our term, we have reduced violence by 40%. We, are, we still have a way to go. We, are in, we were 400,000 400 murders per 100,000 inhabitants. Now we are in 14. Hmm. Wow. So it's a great reduction. But we're becoming an innovation city, and this is the, the, reason, for many, or the reason why many people are talking about Medellin, a city of innovation, a city that is connecting people, a city that in which we are actually turning down Yale's and building schools and universities. We, we had a jail that worked for 100 years. We mm. turned down this jail and we created a, a CATA. It's a center for, for the third industrial revolution, university, and everything is changing right now in Medellin. You have, you have to come to Medellin to invest in Medellin to move your companies to Medellin, where we have the <laughs> talent. We also have the problems. But we've, we see the problems as an opportunity. If we have problems and we have talent, we have a lab there to solve those problems.
Thank you for that. And it's amazing, no? Wow. <laughs> That technology changed your life, right? Uh, computer saved your life. And this is what's interesting about our panel, with Cisco being present, is how that innovation, <laughs> that technology, changed the lives of children who now are leading the region. Casey? <laughs> Thank you very much, Natalie. Thank you to the organizers here in Smart City Expo and World Congress and to my esteemed, esteemed panel. Uh, at Cisco, we do a number of things, and one of the things we do is work across uh, 160 countries, 17,000 healthcare institutions, millions of educators and students, and of course, with governments and government leaders around the world, to think about how technology can impact uh, us as citizens or residents, certainly look at the human impact across the business outcomes. One of the things we are working on and what we look for is an ability to invest. We are currently working with our Country Digital Acceleration Program, or known as CDA, to work with 44 countries and their top priorities right now to work on digitization, to work on anything from climate to innovation, and really think about how do we take technology and use it to improve any, the many things that we're working on in cities, communities, regions, and of course across the country. Some of the things that we've been seeing recently, particularly as we come through this pandemic, are the things with transportation. We've all experienced some of the things with the supply chain issue. When we look at how technology can improve the ports, the situation with our roadways, the situation with airports as we all begin to travel again, those are a number of places that we are applying technology. You may or may not see it, but if you're sitting in an airplane, look out the window, chances are there's something happening around you on the tarmac that has taken advantage of some of the newer technologies. Um, those are some of the things. There's another piece that we do, some of you may or may not be aware of, called networking academies. We have trained millions of students globally to also improve the skill sets and uh, bring to our workforce another layer of technical skill. Something you might know is that we have globally 3.5 million cybersecurity jobs currently available that are unfilled. So we absolutely need to bring our, bring our workforce up to a different level, take advantage of these things for our communities, be able to bring the skills and the talent base to a different place. And to be able to do that, we of course can help make investments with our countries and across the communities. I think the last thing I would just uh, talk about for a minute, of course, is sustainability. One of the things that we're working on and looking at forward to uh, 2040 is being ready with all three categories, including how we operate, what that means to our supply chain, working through about 60,000 different partners that we have on a global level so that we can do this in any context and uh, help work through the communities. I think it's incumbent upon us as technology leaders, as business leaders, and as government leaders to be able to step forward and to help accelerate those services for our residents. Perfect, thank, thank you, you so much. <laughs> and here, virtually present, is our friend Sameh. Sameh, good to have you here today. Wish you were here in person. <laughs> Wish I was here in person. No, thanks a lot, Natalia, and, and um, thanks to uh, Barcelona and to the FIRA for the opportunity of joining this um, excellent panel and sharing with you some of the thoughts of what we do on uh, technology and the intersection with uh, cities, but also with uh, resilience issues. So um, I lead the global practice at the World Bank that is responsible for urban development, disaster risk management, resilience and land. It's a global practice with 450 staff with about $30 billion in uh, lending and financial commitment uh, in uh, with projects in um, about 120 countries. Um, and our team is distributed in over 80 countries uh, in the field. Now, the one common denominator that we've learned with the pandemic is that COVID-19 hit cities really, really hard. 
it, um, you know, the closure of businesses, uh, the uh, disruption to services, transport, among other things, the decline in municipal finances, the uh, exposure to risk, but also the intersection of risks. Um, you know, when a pandemic meets, you know, the, uh, the disaster risk, uh, which is further exacerbated by uh, climate risk, we have situations, you know, that was really, really complicated for many of our cities. And as cities are emerging from the pandemic, basically our work really is to support them on this recovery, on making it green, inclusive and resilient. And I think we have with us, you know, Medellin is a great example of a city that has carried out this type of recovery over the years from a situation of if you will, in conflict or, or post-conflict to uh, the rebound that it is today and, and offers lots of examples. And I think for us, technology is a critical underpinning in this regard because technology is critical in helping cities create the foundation for better municipal finances. It's critical for helping cities optimize service delivery. It's critical for helping even the post-COVID recovery of people and their livelihoods. So just to give you an example, we have uh, structured the system. Um, as you know, in, in most post-disaster setting, there's something called cash for works, where basically people whose livelihoods are affected, yeah. you um, basically uh, engage them in public works and you know pay them uh, to support their livelihoods. So we've structured a cash for digital works uh, variant, which basically uh, engages communities in uh, you know crowdsourcing, into mapping, uh, geolocalized information about their cities. You know, much of the cities we work with are unmapped. We, you know, so being able to know where the flooding points are, being able to know where uh, the solid waste management dumping grounds are happening to help the city better optimize their uh, services. We've also done some really interesting work on predicting COVID-19 hotspots by looking at the city three-dimensionally, calculating the amount of floor space that exists in a neighborhood by neighborhood basis, dividing it over population density, and to see where the places where people might be able to uh, socially distance from the other places that are overcrowded that do not allow for that. And you know, when you throw in the public toilets and the public uh, water uh, standpipes, which are places of contagion risk, we could immediately infer within a city with basically machine learning places that could be contagion hotspots and orient the government so that they can deploy emergency support services, but also program long-term investment. So these are examples in which we are really deploying technology to support the development of green, inclusive, and resilient cities. And this is particularly critical, both for the recovery from COVID-19, but also from you know the next big thing, which is here upon us today, climate change, of course. Thanks, Natalie. Thank you so much. Um, you know, we touched from different pro different uh, contexts, different ideas, different initiatives. I mean, as an urban planner, a lot of people don't think about you know public toilets. Uh, we think about you know how do we create the next SpaceX, but the inclusivity, the the fact that we have to figure out what climate change, how climate change is going to affect us. You know, somebody just mentioned our flood regions, um, density, right? When we create densities in cities, how do we figure out what our citizens need? Do they need uh, more policies or do they need technology? Do they need more infrastructure or do they need more hand-holding? Do they need more entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs or do they need more institutions? And this is, you know, this battle that we constantly go through of like, what is the balance between um, our leaders and our business community, our entrepreneurs and so on. And, and technology was born not only out of entrepreneurs, technology actually was created and, and in many, many ways by good policies, right? Um, you know, for us in the US, we tend to you know, give grants to the crazy ideas. Uh, figure out how we can hack, uh, do hackathons, right? To find uh, what doesn't work. Um, how do we create you know, information where the blockchain can be something interesting uh, for us to be, you know, figure out fraud and have clearer information. So, you know, all this actually 
li really needs a lot of co collaboration, right? How have we been able, and, and just putting at this question out there, and I have a few questions, but how can collaboration, how can we bring the stakeholders together? How has that been able to help you in, in what you're working on? You know, being, being able to, you know, why is this important? How can we put that into practice? How, what are some of the examples where a collaborative approach works? And, you know, I went from negotiating NATO uh, for Czech Republic, Poland, and Hungary uh, in 97 to 2001. And then I came back to the U.S. and I couldn't get New Jersey and Pennsylvania to talk to each other. <laughs> so, and two states within the same country. And, and so we were actually been able to like, if we're able to put some carrots, uh, some incentives, some funding in order for, for, for cities and regions and neighborhoods talk to each other, right? How do, does that collaboration work and how in your experience has that been productive? If you'd like to start, Minister. Just I, I like to start. <laughs> um, I think in general, the people have to understand that at the end of the day, it's better to collaborate because they are much more innovative and disruptive than individually, especially in the digitalization area. And how does it work? Um, in our ministry, we build up a smart region um, area and there the stakeholders meet in round table. And they said to us, what are the needs for them for funding? Mm. For instance, we have in my hometown in Darmstadt, it's a digital city number one in uh, Germany. And they make some best practice programs to optimize city services. On one hand, in how, how um, on-demand services for cars, for instance, or on sensors, on lightning. So if my daughter goes through a park in the night, the light goes on when she is renting through the light, for instance. So if we try to make best practices out of this better city services, um, then these ideas will put in an internet platform and the other cities can use these experiences. And I think this is the kind of how collaboration works. Somebody gets funding for making the best practice and the experience with this best practice they share with the other cities. And this is one approach we are doing. And, and, and in that point, I have been talking about Medellin for a few years since I was there a few years ago um, and how Medellin was, you know, created this, this, the universities, they met, all eight universities kept meeting over years and years and years and that collaborative approach stood ground and they were the foundation for a lot of cooperation where it went into this, this, the stakeholders that were actually, you know, really keen on education and I just think that this is you know, a great example and uh, you know some of the things that you're working on or some of the examples that you're working on. Yeah, Medellin Mer is, is quite exceptional actually when you see cities in Colombia and actually also in Latin America because the cross collaboration between the public and the private sector uh, we are for example uh, the, the public approach and the, how the citizens uh, work and support the public is very important. In Medellin we have the second most important company in the, in the country. It's actually from Medellin and it's public. So I am mayor but I also the president of the board of directors of the second biggest company of Colombia that is EPM. But I also had to go to other uh, board of directors for airports, for example. So I had to deal with airports. I had to deal with uh, convention centers, with uh, universities also, and also with uh, health centers. So uh, I think yesterday, two days ago, I was in a plane and there was a girl sit down next to me and she asked me, well, wh what is the, the worst problem of Medellin and what is the biggest advantage of Medellin? And I said, well, the worst problem is inequality. Mm -hmm. 
And the, the biggest advantage is that we like to work uh, together to solve problems. So, but sometimes I had to, to deal with this question. How is possible that in a city that in which we love to work together, the public, the private sector, the academy, we have 7%, 7 for, exam for example, of, of children between 0 to 5 years old with, uh, how do you call that, desnutrition? Without nutrition. W without nutrition. Yeah. So, and I think the problem is information. And that takes us back to this presentation or to this place. Mm -hmm. So to collaborate, we need to have the right information. What governments lack all the time is information to know what are the problems and where are the problems. But exactly. Sometimes we were watching a problem with nutrition as a statistics. No. Governments need to have like information for every citizen about how they, are, they really are and where they are. So we can solve the problems and so we can put the people together to solve the problems. So what I'm doing right now is I'm working on information in the city. Hmm. Put together information, not as a, a isolated information, every secretary with information. No, we want one place for the information. Every secretary is going to be a client of the, that information. And we're going to create the rules of how you deal with the information. So for example, with the program, with the program of one child, one computer. So what I want in the future, in the near future, next year, with those computers? I want every time a kid, to, they open their computer, I want a simple question. How do you feel? Are you happy or are you sad? Well, mayors don't know how children are feeling. Mm -hmm. What about a question, are you hungry? No. So what, what if a mayor had that information and the localization, the position of that, chi that children that is saying if he's hungry? Sometimes the problem is, is not that you don't have the money. The point is that you don't have the information to solve the problem. So when you talk with a secretary, sometimes they say, we are working on it. <laughs> no, we, we don't want you to be working on it. We want you to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And to solve the problem, you need the information. And you need the, right, the key partners. But if you don't have the right information, you can put together the key partners, and they're not going to do anything. You yeah. need the right information so the key partners can really do something. If I say to the key partners, look, we have this problem here, what, you ca what can you do? That's different fr from a regular meeting in which everyone say, is saying, we are working. No, let's work on the problem with the right information. Yeah. And Casey, you, you know, your projects are expanding across the world, of course. And you mentioned one with 44 countries. Um, and looking at the pandemic and, and all these things that were happening, you know, to the mayor's point, like what type of information, what, what is out there, right? The, the, the private sector, like Cisco, such a great big company, uh, is looking at to do that, to solve some of this. Well, bringing that collaborative approach, right? Absolutely, and, and thank you. And to the mayor's point and the minister's point uh, and the ur urban planner, uh, there are so <laughs> many things, it's complex. And that's the one thing we know. There are many risks, but if we think through the risks and we start with something that is small and doable, it's a great place to begin. I think as we look to the future and the important role that data will begin to play, many people have said data is a new gold. Yeah. I think that the knowledge working and actually the digital skill sets are going to be the new gold. You spoke to it in the same way with your example. And I think as we look across our regions, the, the critical element is to really figure out how to work together. And that's one common thing across each region to be able to do that. 
in that way, we can look through the investments that are ne needed to make. The point that you made exactly, Natalie, is to look at that partnership between the private sector and the public sector, certainly any other consortiums or other interests, mm -hmm. so that we can take both ends with the children and the, our older communities and bring them back together again and do it in a meaningful way. And those are some more of the things, of course, we've learned through the pandemic. Thank you. Same? <laughs> I think, um, I mean, uh, the, the mayor really uh, presented an, an excellent case of how, if you will, the public and the private sector work together. And maybe just to build upon that, I think the most complex problem that we have is the, prob the problem of collaborating across sectors. I mean, yeah. planning by definition within a given city tends to happen the sectoral way, meaning the housing secretariat is proposing investments in housing, maybe in an Excel spreadsheet. The transport uh, department is doing something similar. The water and sanitation department is doing something similar. And they rarely talk to each other. In fact, you know, if you start putting their investments and their sequencing on a map and try to coordinate them spatially, you discover that they, there's no coordination whatsoever. Yeah. And technology can nudge this one forward significantly in the sense that it's, it creates that foundation of information that could bring actors together to try to identify the synergies. But technology will be necessary in this case, but not sufficient because if you don't have the incentives, for these various partners or institutions to collaborate. I mean, you know, you can take a horse to the water, you can't make them drink. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, so, so thinking about structuring the incentives that gets people to collaborate. So for instance, you know, the departments that will, um, you know, collaborate jointly can, you know, access an additional budget or you create an additional pot of money that could be accessed specifically for collaborative projects. When the public sector works with the private sector, the leveraging of resources from other parties. But then it's not just public and private or public and public. I mean, for instance, when you look at most cities, you know, cities like Rio, like Sao Paulo and, and others, they comprise of metropolitan regions that involve multiple municipalities with multiple mayors. I mean, Sao Paulo is basically 39 municipalities together to create one metropolitan region. Yeah. So you need 39 mayors basically to sit down and work together because the mayor of Sao Paulo city proper, you know, might you know, have quite a bit of the jobs in the metropolitan region, but for instance, has the biggest housing affordability challenge, whereas some of the peripheral municipalities might have more affordable housing, maybe lesser of the jobs. So what do you do? Do you, you know, bring jobs to where the people are living? Do you bring people to where the jobs are living, which is a transportation problem? Or do you do an integrated solution? So you need to figure out ways to get also you know, municipalities to work together, but also levels of government, because, I mean, much of if you will, the levers to influence action of, on climate change might be in mayor's hands, but there are some of them, like energy generation, you know, lies with higher levels of government, you know. Uh, if it's something, if we're talking about city competitiveness, I mean, a city might have, you know, access to multiple influencing points like institutions, policies, access to land, to infrastructure, but, you know, there might be things related to education or access to finance that, you know, higher levels of government, national government might control. So I think, you know, coordination is the most elusive challenge. And I'm really glad that you brought this one up, uh, Natalie, because technology can do a lot to bridge the gaps, but you will need to couple up technology with incentives to be able to right. uh, come up with a lasting solution. And those incentives are key, right? Um, because a lot of, you know, in, in general, you know, people feel disenfranchised. They, they feel like the institutions are not listening to them. The banking industry is losing a lot of the younger generation. Uh, they're not trusting the way that we actually do, di you know, currency. I was looking into digital currency. Um, we have all these conversations of, you know, young people want to be involved, but they feel like they're not being heard. And where I always say, that's what, what's great about the internet and about technology is that we at one point did you know, want to have more information, but we were limiting it, very limiting. I remember as an urban planner in a region of uh, 7 million people in greater Philadelphia, um, they were doing the surveys and we got 120 surveys back out of 7 million people. So I, w I said, I think we should do online surveys. This is 2007 before your iPhone. Um, and, you know, there's this little company in Palo Alto called SurveyMonkey 
And they, and my bosses, 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 just could, they're like, that, we cannot do that. That just, that just sounds funny, doesn't seem to, I don't think it's gonna work. And so I pushed and pushed and pushed, and we have 5,340 surveys online. And, uh, and it was amazing. It changed the trend as to what the citizens wanted, what the citizens really understood, you know, understood from our perspective. So it was, you know, it's how do we, how do we push that? And today, um, I'm going to ask a question on, on mobility, because from the last mile, the, the, during the pandemic, uh, supply chain and logistics became a big part of how do we reach people for medicine, for food, and everything. And for me, mobility well, was a different question for, because I, uh, we have a, a, in Congress, in our U.S. Congress, we have a new Smart City Caucus, and they were afraid of the autonomous vehicle. So the autonomous vehicle is coming, and they're just like, we don't know anything what's going on with this, so how do we regulate this? How are we going to regulate the autonomous vehicle? So I'm like, wow, we, we can't kill the autonomous vehicle. We have to figure out how do we work together? How do we create the second and third tier technology? How do we make cities smarter? Not just about green building, but more integrated cities where the autonomous vehicles and other services can come up, right? What, what is that looking like? Um, you know, in Europe, in Latin America, the idea of the question when something comes and it's going to change the way we design, this, the way we practice. Um, and I always think, look, in Honduras, where I was born in Honduras, um, the la so the last mile, right? That how do we access that? How do we have either you know scooters or, or motorcycles or electric bikes or drones, right? How do we fi figure out how to fight poverty by being ha having access to that? And mobility, I think, is one of the key things. And in our Smart City Expo actually has a uh, very focused part on mobility for the future. So. You know, you know, whoever wants to start and, and, and bring that. I know if anyone has questions, we're going to have some time, I hope, for questions uh, from the audience. But I think that this is a question that we need to really address uh, in the, for the future. That's you know, right. Whoever and wants I to think, jump in. <laughs> yes, but, but you think um, the, the problem is that change and people makes people always a little bit in not comfortable with change. Yeah. So that is human, <laughs> human being. And uh, we have it in our genes that if something make a great change, you do not feel comfortable with it. And I think our task, my job is to trust or to build trust for the people that they, that I can take them by my hand and take them with the challenge of the future of digitalization. And building trust means involve the people. When we build up this strategy in Hessen, I do not ask only my colleagues and we make a cross-section initiative. We also ask the people. We invite them to discuss with us. And that takes half a year. But after half a year, and then when we go through um, the digitalization in the regions, I think the people trust that we do what they change their lives on one hand with the technique, but on the other hand, they understand that we only want to do it for their benefit. And that's how we serve, right? We serve for the, for, for, to the, for the people. <laughs> Well, you cannot get su success in a company with all technology. The same happened with government. You need to have the best technology you want to get success. So we have, uh, at the same time, a problem. I, I, was, I was just reading that in the United States right now, because the logistic problem they need 80,000 uh, truck drivers, yeah. and they don't have them yeah. uh, to move the containers. <laughs> they don't have the people. So actually, this is going to push forward the automatization of the workforce. But for cities like Medellin and countries like Colombia, for example, uh, that is going to impact the workforce. So. Using Medellin, for example, in Colombia, we have 
80,000 80, taxi drivers. So what is the mission of governors and mayors like me? We have to, to, to form, to educate, to, to, gi to, give, to give education, the best education for people so they can move forward uh, to, and, and to have the skills mm -hmm. so they can get, get into the transformation of the world further is going to happen. Uh, mm -hmm. But definitely, the, the, the strategy cannot be a stop, a stop the change. No, we have to bring the change and make it happen in your cities with the people of your city. Mm -hmm. So right now, in what we are educating people or creating um, loans and, and, and giving like education, metaverse, for example, how, how to be, how may it become a center for the developing of the tools and the, and in general, the metaverse, mm -hmm. uh, artificial intelligence, blockchain. So we cannot let that this happen in other cities. We need that to happen in our cities. And there is actually a competition on that. So we need to compete. At, we are competing, but if we don't realize that we are competing, you don't take the right decisions. Uh, I'm a software developer. And it's not, it's, it's not actually strange that people have voted for me as mayor. No, people is realizing that the world is changing and they need IT people also in the government. So I, I think that that is going to happen in many other cities, not just in Colombia, but in the world. Yeah, and across the world, I mean, in the last, our last congressional elections, we had teachers, we had doctors, we had engineers which was something very refreshing. Hmm. Casey, any points to, to that as, as far as like what you think some of the ideas? I, I think in terms of mo mobility, there are two sides of that equation. I think not only are we looking at this massive urbanization that continues around the world, in which case it's important to have the skills and all of the things available, but it goes the other way as well. Some of the things that we've seen as we begin, begin to close the digital divide and as we get more connectivity, as you've noted, Mayor, out into the rural areas, are that many of those families who might think that they had to come into the city to make a living now can actually do it from where they are and they can remain with their families. And some of those things are as important as what we're doing in the urban environments so that someone who might have been selling something on the side of the road can then do it from their home with the internet and become the breadwinner for their family. So I think it, be go, it goes both directions in the context of that mobility. Yeah, and, and you know, Sami, I know you're gonna jump in here. For like rural areas, right? You know, uh, the World Bank is doing an amazing job of trying to empower a lot of folks in the rural areas and, and figure out that management of things. Sami, any ideas? Um, definitely, Natalia. I mean, maybe just let me pivot because one of the, if you will, biggest ideas that emerged out of the pandemic, which is the 15-minute city, yeah. uh, is in many ways, you know, a rethinking of mobility. So let me, you know, let me chime in a little bit on that. I mean, so it's clear after, you know, almost two years of pandemic that the future of work as a trend has accelerated more towards hybrid work, more towards uh, home-based working. I mean, basically the surveys are suggesting that whereas we were talking pre-pandemic of maybe 20% of the people uh, working from home, maybe 20% of the time, we're talking now about something closer to 60% of the workers and somewhere around 40% of the time. So we're talking about, you know, maybe in, in many, many places, anything close to 50% of the workforce potentially working from home with major implications on what the city and its configuration are. There's, you know, your downtown, your central business district is no longer going to be the central business district. It's going to be something different and it has to evolve into something more mixed use development, etc. And with it came the idea of the 15 minute city, you know, bringing closer to home uh, much of the day to day activities, whether it's work or leisure or shopping or, you know, public spaces, etc. And I think it's a great idea. It's got, you know, uh, things about, you know, reducing unnecessary commutes, uh, making life, if you will, more pleasurable, more efficient. 
but it's got risks as well. And the biggest risk associated with it is that of segregation, that you'll end up with basically 15-minute uh, uh, hamlets or villages where you know people will be differentiated by income groups. And this undermines, if you want, the whole premise of the city, which is access to opportunities. It's A city is about agglomeration, about knowledge spillovers, about you being able to access, you know, half or more of the jobs of the city, hopefully in half an hour of commute, not, you know, just minimizing, uh, if you will, the commute. So I think technology comes in really, really in an important way, you know, to try to tackle some of those disadvantages. So whereas mobility here would be thinking about shifting towards more micro mobility, active mobility, walking, cycling, etc. I think, you know, the way information is going to be available about the labor markets, about housing and housing affordability, and the kinds of opportunities that technology can create in a context like this would be critical to make the city more inclusive and livable. So in a sense, capitalizing on the benefits that are coming with the so-called 15-minute city, but tackling the challenges of, if you will, segregation and isolation um, and socioeconomic uh, exclusion that may arise, you know, if the whole notion of the city, you know, gets withered down um, and, and you can no longer access the jobs in the city. So I think technology and especially access to information becomes really critical. And I really like, you know, so I think it ties in really, really nicely with what the mayor has been saying about, you know, his work on empowering people to have that access to information, you know, and, and creating that bridge. And thank you, um, because today we're looking at all these digital nomads, right? Um, mm -hmm. People are actually states and cities and countries are figuring out how to attract some of this labor. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the context here would be like, how do we tax them? <laughs> What's the taxing structure? But we need to, to start, and I love this idea of 15-minute city, almost like a pop-up type of thing, but it, but it solves... Uh, the issue really quickly, right? And, and it actually, I think, creates a lot of good information and data. Um, is there any, you know, questions you have for each other? Because I, I know that we could keep on talking for a while, but is there anything in particular that you'd like to raise? We only have a few more minutes to, to, to have this discussion, but is there something that is you want to share with the audience? If the audience, I know that, that I want to say hi to all the folks that are actually watching us virtually. Um, that is one of the advantages, right, of, of being able to share that. One, one point I would like to stress and I would like to uh, interact with you. For me, it's important in the future, and even uh, uh, Sami had raised this, how we can connect the rural areas and have a balance between the city and the rural areas. We as ministry invest money. They get money, for instance, for a special start-up community in the rural areas. Digital Pioneer is um, this funding program. We uh, invest in e-health activities right. in the rural areas. We invest in mobility, for instance, on-demand services in the rural areas. And I would like to hear your excesses, how we connect the rural areas with the cities, because I think these are the areas where the digitalization of the future really have a lot of benefits more than in the cities, maybe. Hmm. Well, this is a Cisco <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we are doing white space, we are, but definitely we think we need more, so. Cisco, please. <laughs> and, and you know, Cisco has a smart city program and e health, and, and you talked about he health and education. And the minister has a really good point: is how do we connect that right Us using technology? So we've done some pretty fun things in the past year or so. Uh, one started just before that, where we looked at healthcare specifically using something called the Medibus in your uh, lovely country where we applied technology, put it in transportation, and offered it in a better way to rural communities and to uh, elderly citizens so that we could bring not only health care to those communities more often where perhaps young doctors or young physicians wouldn't stay in those communities and we could still bring that, those services to the residents. It's a great way of taking that mobility piece mm -hmm. and turning it around and also applying technology as an easy answer to help, with this, to help build through the solution. 
I think there's some other things that we've also seen uh, in the near term where we've looked at taking uh, an approach with homelessness in some of the communities to actually create an opportunity to pull more engagement in and to pull both services together with the homeless communities where we've been able to say now we have a healthier community because we have less of the homelessness going on at the same time. I think lastly, um, we've all been talking about lighting and parking and some of the other things in our cities for many, many years. Uh, but a great example of taking that to the next level is something that happened in Vijayawada in India where they put together the Golden Mile and they really are taking all of those attributes and those applications to a new level to say what data do we have, how can we create a healthier environment for our communities, how can we extend it to more citizens and anyone who might be visiting. So it's that ability to pull tourism in at the same time. So it's a little bit as if we were taking things we already know how to do with technology, taking it, expanding it further, broadening the application, making it available and scaling it for more people. And I think that's where, you know, um, people get a little bit like, we got to do more. We got to, you know, we can't just wait for policies to, to, to go through and blah, blah. I think that's where technology has helped us figure out how to bring that information and that uh, enthusiasm. Uh, and that input from people, right? Of what can we do more? That's why I think the business community has to be at the table at all these decisions. But you wanted to say something. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to add something uh, to the question, and is that even the rural areas are a main challenge we have right now. And obviously, in in Latin American countries, this is a really big, big issue. Mm. Like increasing the speed of the connectivity. Mm -hmm in cities is also a main issue mm -hmm. because uh, some areas, some neighborhoods, they have internet connection, but they have a bad internet connection. Yeah. So they are no, uh, they, they can yeah. download some information, but they, they cannot really create information and connect with the uh, uh, value change of the digital economy that is being created and is moving right now. So yeah. increasing the speed of communities in general is, is a key issue in which we have to work a lot. Yes, but that we only do as well in collaboration because it's not me who can say, okay, tomorrow I will build up a new digital infrastructure uh, broadband. It's only in collaboration with the companies. And I think this is we have to emphasize that we have, a seen, have to see it as a future challenge to be as fast as possible. Uh, that is only in working together with the companies. I, I, I'm going to tell you a story of Medellin. Medellin, mm -hmm. actually, another of the companies of Medellin is, is Tigouni. It's like the second telecommunication company of the country. But seven years ago, we sell our, not, not the majority, but the control of the company. So we are, it's still a public company but we sell the control to a private company, a Millicon, to Millicon. So Millicon start investing in other cities and not in our city. Uh, so what, I, what I'm doing right now, I'm building a neutral network to increase competition. Oh, so what, what, what was happening before, we were blocking competition so other companies cannot get into the city. What I'm doing right now is opening competition, even against my own company, or the, the public company. So sometimes it's collaboration, sometimes it's increasing competition. So what are the barriers that are not letting the, the companies to get into the market? You're right. And sometimes also to give incentives to the areas in which it's not profitable. But what our job is as well, to have less bureaucracy. Yeah. Less bureaucracy? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah that's, I think that that's key, right? <laughs> and I think that's where we um, can all agree on. How do we you know, break that bureaucracy out? And Digital sure, processes. Yeah, and instance. efficiency and, and decentralization and many things that we are starting to talk about. Yeah. Summit, do you have some ideas? <laughs> yeah, maybe to bring 
bit more of a developing country perspective, especially on, on this dimension of, if you will, rural to urban migration, and, and how can you ensure that you have a balanced territorial development? I think, you know, there are places like Latin America, which is now, what, 82% urban. So, I mean, it, it's a region that has already matured in terms of urbanization rate as, as well as Europe. But there are still Africa and, and you know, and uh, South Asia in particular that are urbanizing at very fast paces. And usually you have two dimensions in there. You've got a pull factor and a push factor. The pull factor is the pull for jobs, for better services in the city. And there's nothing you can do about that. I mean, you know, all what you can do is invest in, you know, investing in human capital in rural areas. And then, you know, you people, what they do, they migrate, they stay, is a function of the opportunity. But I think there's a lot that we can do on the push factor that technology can do. So for instance, you know, if a drought hits a rural area and, you know, farmers, you know, out there have not been supported on having access to risk information to be able to predict when that drought might be happening, yeah. to be able to adapt their agriculture, to become climate smart agriculture that is more drought resistant. Uh, if there's no safety net that can intervene when a drought hits, uh, like in a country like Ethiopia or otherwise, that provides livelihoods to those poor you know, rural communities whose livelihood has been stricken by uh, a disaster from a natural hazard, a drought, a cyclone, a flood, etc., then you will end up having, if you will, you know, totally disrupted livelihoods in rural areas, migration to urban areas in search for anything. The other one is conflict as well. I mean, you know, conflict is a big, wow. yeah. you know, force that pushes people into towards cities in a push factor. So I think technology can play a very, very important role in, in attenuating the impact of those push factors and leveling, if you will, the access to human capital, to uh, economic development opportunities that can make people thrive in rural areas. Lastly, one of the most important things that you can do for rural livelihoods is better connect them to cities. Because I mean, farmers need access to markets, you know, and, and it's with that access to markets that they can sell their products, that they can get the services that the city offers that they don't have in rural areas. And of course, that access is not just physical access, but it's digital access as well. Yeah, thank you for that. And just to leave you with all, I know we're actually running out of time, but um, think about it this way. All of the different points are interconnected. We all talk about uh, how we actually can you know, connect, have access, human capital investment, technology, and think about it in a circular economy way, right? The, we talk about climate change and how we're gonna change things, but it's all about this collaborative approach, sharing best practices, learning, and making sure that some of those gaps are closed, how we actually fight poverty, how we actually be able to, to, to innovate in, in conflictive times. Uh, but most important is be able to think of it in a peaceful manner where we can actually talk to each other, uh, be able to collaborate and, and think outside the box and be as innovative as possible and build better cities for the future. With that note, I want you all, please, please give a big round of applause to our wonderful panelists for being here today. Thank you so much. <laughs>